Welcome to our program that we have titled A Revelation of the Coming King. Let me first introduce myself. I am Ranko Stefanovic, professor at Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary, Andrews University, Bering Springs, Michigan. And I'm so excited to be with you here and go through that series. Why I'm so excited? Because for the first time in my life, I'm taping a series on the book of Revelation that covers all the chapters of this book. It means from chapter one to chapter 22. So I want to express my deep gratitude to 3ABM for inviting me and making this occasion and, and taping of this series a possible. I'd like to invite our viewers to support this ministry because we want to understand the word of God better and proclaim God's everlasting gospel to the world. Why am I so excited about the book of Revelation? For at least two reasons. The first one is very serious. The second one is a little bit informal. It was after many years of being a Christian and I started to study the book of Revelation. I met Jesus Christ. He spoke to me through this book and believe me, he changed my life completely upside down. And I just want to tell to all of you if God was able through this book to speak to me and to change me, he can do it with every person in the world. Yeah. Actually, my first presentation that we'll be just doing just in a few minutes I want to share with you how actually the book of Revelation changed my perspective with reference to God, changed my Christian life, made me a better Christian, loving Christian, and motivated me to meet that king who will very, very soon appear on the clouds. Why am I in the book of Revelation? For the second reason is, if you go to the book of Genesis, in chapter 11, we read there that there was a time in the past when all the people on the earth, they spoke one language, and that language was English. Are you excited about that? But then there are some technical problems there at the Tower of Babel, and people got accents. So please don't blame me. Blame the Tower of Babel there. But I decided not to stay in the book of Genesis. I decided to go to the book of Revelation because according to this book, chapter seven, the time is coming very soon when all the people of all nations, all generations, all tongues, they'll be there before the throne of God. And once again, all the people will use one language and that language will be English. <laughs> you know why I'm doing this. I want just to tell you, yes, I have a heavy accent. But I believe if God used a donkey to speak to Balaam, if he was able to use a rooster to convert Peter, he can use also a very strange accent, even my accent, to speak to people and to present a testimony about how God changes human lives. So please pray for me. Please pray for me that God gives me that spiritual gift of speaking tongues. And I'll be praying for you that God gives you the spiritual gift of understanding the tongues. Amen. But we are all together for, for one purpose. So from now on, it will be a long series. We will go section by section, a chapter by chapter. We'll go, be going through the book of Revelation. But in order to do it, it's impossible to cover everything in the time that is allotted to us. As I mentioned, this is for the first time that I am taping a series that covers the entire book of Revelation. At Andrews University, usually I have 45 hours and I'm able to cover about 10 to 12 chapters with my students and they're constantly complaining how fast we are going through the material. That's the reason we need a good textbook. Are you with me? So that after each one of these presentations, you can go and take that textbook 
and to find much deeper sense of the text that we will cover each presentation. We need a good textbook. And I'm so happy that this moment I can present to you the best textbook. I really mean that, the best textbook for studying the book of Revelation. If you use the textbook, you cannot miss the meaning of the, of, of, of the, of the, of the text. And I'd like to encourage all of you, our viewers, that you come and bring that textbook for yourself. And believe me, you can buy that, that, that textbook even for 25 cents. I don't know you wonder what I'm talking about. I want to present to you the best textbook for studying the book of Revelation. If you follow the instructions from this book, you cannot miss in understanding of the main message of the book of Revelation. Doesn't mean that you, we will get the answer to every problem, each detail of this book, but this is the infallible guide to the understanding of this book. So I would like to encourage you, I'd like to encourage our, our viewers to take this book, to put in your hands, because we will refer to this book very, very often as we are trying to get much deeper sense and meaning of the text of the book of Revelation. But we need also some t other tools that can help us in order to understand the messages of the book of Revelation. And our present the presentations that I will be making, our studies during this series, actually will be followed by the material that is found in this book titled The Revelation of Jesus Christ. And you will notice the author is Ranko Stefanovic. It means that this book is a product of many years of research, my own research of the book of Revelation. Actually, you will find in this book the product of my research, the product of many other scholars, their research, and you will find also what our church today officially teaches and believes about the book of Revelation. So I would like to invite the viewers and each one of you, if you can provide a copy of this commentary for yourself, and I'd like to do something if we can make an agreement. Every time at the end of one segment of my presentation, before we conclude, I will give you the pages from this commentary that will tell you that you can go and follow and continue to study that topic for yourself. I'd like to invite you, if you have some very good friends of yours, uh, uh, some other church members that are with you in, in your congregation, make a small group. Take that portion of the book of Revelation, study together, and deep, much, much deeper. And what riches, what a wealth of information you will get from the, from, from, from the text of this last book of the, of the Bible. So please, pray for me as we are going through this series. I'm a trained scholar. I'm trained how to think critically, not to take anything for granted, try to find really what the text says. I read the book of Revelation in original languages. But I want to remind you, I'm simply human. When sometimes people refer to me as an expert in the book of Revelation, I feel very uncomfortable because there is only one expert and he knows everything, believe me. Unfortunately, he's not here with us. However, he gives some people an opportunity and time to study the book of Revelation in a much deeper way and to share it with others. So I'm not here to teach you. I'm not here to even to preach to you. I'm not here to instruct you. I am here simply to share with you what I have learned from this book, at the same time to share with you what my church today believes and the understanding that my church today has with regard to different parts and portions with, 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 with this book. So please pray for me. We are simply human beings. And I pray to God that I'll be praying for you. You know, we are all tempted with something. When we come to the book of Revelation, sometimes we hold our favorite view. 
And we think that the view that I hold is the Bible. Everybody who disagrees with me, it's contrary to the Bible. But we are simply humans. We need the mercies of God. We need the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So please pray for me. I will pray for you because it's my prayer to God that this series for all of us becomes a journey to the last book of the Bible that at the end we all can say, yes, I found Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation and he transformed and he changed my life completely. That's actually the reason that we are going, going here through this, through this book. That's why we would like to spend this time by studying the book of Revelation in a much deeper, deeper way. So I promise I will be praying for you. You pray for me. So before we go to the first text of the book of Revelation to share with you how God changed the book of Revelation to, to transform my personal life, I'd like just that we ask God for guidance as we're going through this book. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us this opportunity so that we can go and take this book, the revelation of the coming King. And we would like to hear your voice speaking to us. Father, we are aware that there are many difficult passages in this book. There are many things we would like to understand better. And we feel how people are struggling to make so many times a sense of some difficult portions of the book of Revelation. But please help us that we can understand the central message, the message that will really change and transform our personal lives. Thank you, Father, for our guidance. Thank you for being with us. And we pray all of this in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As I promised to you that we will follow this textbook. So please, I'd like to ask you that we open the first text and the first statement of the book of Revelation, namely Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. Are you ready for this? Okay. So Revelation 1, verse 1. I would just like to read the first line. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things which must soon take place. We would like, during the time that is allotted to us now, to understand something from this opening statement of the book. And that's about two central themes that this opening statement introduces to us that's very crucial, very important for the understanding of the rest of the book. Two central themes. The first one, it's introduced in the opening statement, the revelation of Jesus Christ. I want to do, do something. The word rev revelation that we have actually comes from the Greek word apocalypsis. Just that you see how it's a little bit complicated to read, to read Greek. But already you guess what it means. The Greek word apocalypsis actually renders the meaning what we have today, the word apocalypse. The Greek word apocalypse actually consists of two words, apo, which means from or of, and the word kalypse, which simply means covering. So any guess? What is the meaning of the word apocalypse? It simply means unveiling, revealing, and uncovering. So we have already here something very interesting at the, at the very beginning. And what is that that actually we learn? That the opening line of this book is telling us that this is the unveiling, uncovering, revealing of Jesus Christ. 
Now you already guess that from this we have the word apocalypse. And that this opening line actually gives us the title of the last book of the Bible. That we call it the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, many people do not call it the apocalypse or revelation Jesus Christ. They simply call it the apocalypse. Now there is a question, the apocalypse of what? And I meet many very good Christians, but when they come to the book of Revelation, they are telling me, this book does not make sense to me. Because for some people, this is the revelation of those final events that are terrifying that are very, 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 very scary. And that's why many people are discouraged, actually, to go and to study this, this, this book. As I mentioned, that this opening statement actually provides the title of the book. What is the purpose of a title? Have you ever thought, you have a book, seven, 800 pages, thick book and you just have uh, three, four words that appear on the cover. Actually, those three, four words, they provide in a nutshell the content of the entire book. As you read the title, you know exactly what the book is all about. Am I correct? If I want to learn something about history of the United States, I go to the bookstore. What is the title that I'm looking for? The answer is clear. Let me ask you one question. When Christians, they call the last book of the Bible the revelation of Jesus Christ, what do they expect to find in this book? When today there is a movie and you see a flood of young people going and running to watch that movie, and you ask them, what is the title of the movie? They say, it's the apocalypse. And when young people are going to watch that movie, what do they expect to watch? Jesus Christ, his life? You know what young people, they say, they expect to see, to watch action, bloodshed, persecution, torture, final events, and everything that is associated with that. And my question is, who invented such a meaning of the content of the last book of the Bible or the meaning of the word apocalypse? The Christians actually is telling us about the way how the Christians understand the book of Revelation. So please allow me now. It is understanding of this phrase that actually changed my, my perspective. Please, I would like that we point to something that the very title of the last book of the New Testament is telling us what we are supposed to find in this book. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. But you know many Christians are debating. And in English so many times, uh, it doesn't look problematic, but in Greek, it's a big problem. When you say the revelation of Jesus Christ, apocalypse is to Jesu Christo. It can be understood in two different ways. Is it so-called, well, just to make it a little bit problematic, is it subjective or objective genitive? Which means, is this the book that came from Jesus Christ, that he is the source of that revelation, or is this book about Jesus Christ? You see, usually when we read, just a casual reader, that, that does not see the difference but can be understood in two different ways. And the scholars are debating. I just want to su su suggest to you that both meanings are implied here. Mm -hmm. If you see verse one, it says, the re revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things which must soon take place. And he, Jesus, he sent and he communicated it by his angel to his servant John. He telling us th that it is from Jesus Christ. Are you with me? It's, it came from him. He's the one who sent that revelation. But please, let's go to verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierce him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. Suddenly, he's not only just the source. 
He, the book of Revelation, is about him. He is the main object of the book of Revelation. By the way, is that what our Christian doctrine is all about? It came from Jesus Christ, but it's about Jesus Christ. The entire Bible is about that. The entire Bible came from God, came from Jesus Christ. But Jesus said, read it, study it, because it testifies about me. So the book of Revelation is the line with the basic premise of Christianity. It came from Jesus, but it's about him. By the way, if you go from chapter 1 all up to chapter 22, you will see that Jesus Christ is the main focus of this book. The very beginning, he's introduced the Alpha and the Omega. <laughs> he is the beginning of the end. What I'm trying to say, this phrase is found in chapter 1, it's found in chapter 22. The book begins with that, and the book concludes with that. The entire book is about this. So I just want to tell you the book of Revelation is not intended to be a kind of Hollywood apocalypse, littered with bizarre and horrible events to come on the world that causes fear and concern to all of us by naming it the revelation of Jesus Christ. The inspired author wanted to tell us that we understand that the book he wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit offered a new portrayal of Christ that could be found nowhere else. That's why this book is so much important. And please allow me to share two things with you. Number one, I promise to you that I will explain to you how God changed my life by studying this book. What I discovered, that the book of Revelation is as much the gospel as the four gospels are. And I really mean that. Amen. Let me explain this. You know four Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When you read those four Gospels, what do you find there? You know, let, let me just put it in a simple way. About God, who took a human form, he came down to the earth to save the fallen humanity. So after his ministry, he died on the cross, he was buried, he resurrected, and he ascended there to the heavenly places. You know that. What is he doing over there? You know that. He intercedes on behalf of us. Please, can you open any of the four Gospels to learn about that? What is he doing there in the heavenly places? No. Because the four Gospels, they end with his ascension. But there are two books of the New Testament that are very important. And those two books, they begin at the point where the four Gospels end. Are you still with me? So the four Gospels, they end with the ascension of Jesus. And the book of Hebrews and the book of Revelation begin with that point of Jesus' existence. They describe Jesus who is there in the heavenly places. When you read the book of Hebrews, Jesus is there, the priest and the high priest, intercedes on behalf of us. But you will find in the book of Hebrews that Jesus is also our king. Hebrews 8 verse 1 says, We have a such high priest who sat there on the heavenly throne at the right hand of the greatest there in the heavenly places. But when you go to the book of Revelation, the emphasis is on Jesus as our king. That's why we titled this series in, in such a way. While in the book of Revelation, he's still our priest. And you will see very soon in our third or fourth presentation, we'll see him as a priest there. But the emphasis of the book is on his royal and kingly ministry. So now you see, both four Gospels, and the book of Revelation, they deal with the same Jesus. Are you still with me? Amen. The only difference is that the four Gospels are dealing with the earthly Jesus, man of Galilee, 
who is in the human flesh. But the book of Revelation portrays the glorified Christ who is there in the heavenly places working on behalf of us and our salvation. But let me explain a little bit more. This is the second point what I wanted to introduce here is. You know, when we read the four Gospels, and before Jesus left, he left to his disciples and to all of us two promises. In these two promises, all other promises are incorporated. The first promise is, I will refer to Matthew 28, verse 20. And I will be with you. How long? Always. How long? Always. Until the very end of the age. This is the first promise that Jesus left. And the second one is, probably the best representative text, is the Gospel of John, chapter 14, 1 to 3. I will come again. When I prepare the place for you, when I prepare the place, I will come again and you will be there where I am. So I will be with you always until the very end. But when the end comes, then I will come again to take you so you will be there where I am. See, these two promises, they incorporate all other promises. And the purpose of the book of Revelation is to tell us how actually Jesus is fulfilling these two promises. The first 19 chapters of the book describing how actually Jesus, while he's there in heaven, he's supporting his church. He's supporting you and me in our struggles to overcome sin and to prepare ourselves for that greater the moment that we are waiting so much to meet him one day when he comes to the cloud. So he's telling us actually how he is with his people until the very end. Are you still with me? And then the last three, four chapters of the book, it's very hard to draw the line, okay, are telling us how he will come again and take us there where he is and we will with me. So now you understand why for me the book of Revelation is a truly the gospel. <laughs> Revealing Jesus Christ and telling me how great a Savior he is to me. There is no difference between the book of Revelation and four Gospels. So I really dare to say that, Revelation, that the last book of the New Testament is titled The Apocalypse. The Apocalypse of Jesus Christ is actually the fifth Gospel of the New Testament. But please... Whenever I present this topic, people become excited. They said, oh boy, I always thought that the book of Revelation is telling us about the future. From now on, I don't want to think about the future. There is no prophecies in the book of Revelation. It's just about Jesus Christ. Just wait. Remember we mentioned that the very introduction to the book of Revelation give us two central themes. This is just the first theme, so please, can you go back to the text? It tells us, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things which must soon take place. Please, can you help me? This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. But what is the purpose of the book? To tell us what will happen in the future. And you will notice how Christians are jumping from one to another extreme. For some Christians, this is simply the revelation of Jesus Christ, and that's what they like to hear. Some other Christians, everything that they find in the book of Revelation is about the future. And please, I try to use different expressions, and I hope that you will understand me. For some Christians, the book of Revelation is a kind of a crystal ball, a kind of a horoscope, another Nostradamus book. A fortune teller book. However, you will have to keep in mind that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. But the purpose of the book is to tell us what will happen in the future. So how can we reconcile these two opening statements? Is it revelation of Jesus Christ or is it a book that is telling us about the future? 
And my answer is yes. <laughs> Please, let me explain it. Any person who is confronted with the content of the book of Revelation will realize the book of Revelation has 22 chapters. That most of those 220 chapters are about the future. We cannot deny it. And that's what leads some Christians really just to see in the book of Revelation the future events. But let me suggest something to you. That the primary purpose of the book of Revelation, one more time, the primary purpose or exclusive purpose of the book of Revelation is not simply to inform us about the future. But the purpose of the revelation of the future is to move us to the right Christian living. To make us to be a better Christians. And also to impress and to seal on our mind the promise that Jesus made to all of us that he will be with us always until the very end of the age and finally that he will come at the end and to take us to ourselves. So please, you will now allow me to explain it a little bit in, in, uh, in my, my own way. In the book of Testimonies to Ministers, page 118, there is a statement that really made this presentation possible, the statement really to move him, to go into that direction, to find but that first and central theme of the book of Revelation. Listen to this statement. Advance new principles and crowd in the clear cut truth, but be not too ready to take a controversial attitude. There will be times when we must stand still and see the salvation of God. Let Daniel speak, let the revelation speak and tell what is truth. But whatever phase of the subject is presented, uplift Jesus as the center of all hope, the root and the offspring of David, and the bright and the morning star. What a statement. So now let me explain how the book that is titled The Revelation of Jesus Christ, but its purpose is to tell us about what will happen in the future. How that book can change somebody's life. How those two statements really, they, they fit nicely together. Actually, it is be because of the needs of my students at Andrews University. I invented, keep it in mind, I invent, invented this illustration. This is just an illustration that I usually use and I'd like to explain really how this opening sentence of the book of Revelation synchronizes the title with the main purpose of the book. Are you still with me? So let me use this illustration. Can you just imagine that there is a family, a husband and a wife, and they have a boy. They have a problem with him. The boy does not know anything what he will do in his life. Of course, the parents, they worry about that. But one day, he comes to his parents telling them, I decided to do something with my life. I decided to go and to study at that university. Oh boy, the parents are excited. But at the same time, they are sad because they, uh, th their son is flying to a very distant place, two, three hours by airplane. He's going to study there at the Andrews University. They will miss him. But they're happy that he decided to do something in his life. One more time, I invented this illustration. That's not something real. The long awaited day has come. Everything is packed. They are ready to take all those luggages, to put in the car, and the father is ready to take his son to the airport. But surprisingly, the father looks into his son and he said, son, and he pulls the chairs and puts there two chairs. And he said, son, please, would you sit here on this chair, you and me, we have first to talk. And you know what happened with kids. They can stay in the bed until 10 in the morning. 
as soon as you want to talk to them, suddenly they are in rush to go somewhere. And, and, and the boy said, Dad, we have to run to the airport. But the father is very serious. Son, please sit there. I want to talk to you. That's okay, Dad. And the father looks into his face. He said, son, let me just ask you one question. Have you ever thought about the life that you will have there in that city and at that university? You know the boy. Dad! No, no, the father is very serious. Son, this is a very serious question. And the father said, my son, let me explain to you how your life we look there at that city. He says, every morning, you will get up, have a quick breakfast, and go to your class. Another class, another class, another class. And the lunch time in the late afternoon will come. You will take that lunch, and you will have to run to be on time with your work, because you will have to work in order to survive at that university. And after your work in the evening, you run to your room there to study and to prepare your assignments for tomorrow class. And in the morning, you will get up. You know already the story. You will run to the class, after the class, in the afternoon work, after the work, back to your room to study, to prepare for the next day class. The next day, and you know already the story. And the father notices. As the son was cynical, etc., that his hand is going down. And he is carefully listening to what his father is telling him. And then the father says, And my son, the exam will come. You will work. Then you will run back to your room to study, to prepare yourself for the exam. And you'll be studying the whole night. And in the morning, you will come to take the exam. After that exam, going to work. In the evening, go back to your room to study for the next exam. I invented this story. Okay? Let me ask you, as the father is portraying that future to his son, which is very realistic, what are the thoughts that they come to his son's mind? I'm making a mistake. I am leaving. Is that the purpose that the father wants to have the conversation with his son? Okay, you have to hear the rest of my story. The father sees that his son is completely confused. And he's uh, thinking whether to go or to stay. Now the father makes the following statement. It's just a few sentences. Before that, the conversation is for about 15, 20 minutes. Very long conversation, but just a few sentences. I said, my son. This is the kind of your future that is awaiting to you there in that city. But the reason why I want to have this conversation is just for a simple reason to assure you that you will finish your studies at that university and you will graduate because your mother and your father will be working with you to support you. The time sometimes will come you will be discouraged. You will not know what to do. You will give us a phone call. We will encourage you. Sometimes when the situation becomes so critical, we will, we will buy a flight ticket and come to spend some short time with you. But because maybe of your many exams and overwhelming assignments that will, that will be on you, you will have to quit some hours of your work and you will come into the financial crisis. You just give us a phone call. We will go and borrow money and to send to you. Son, yes, the life at that university will not be easy. It will be challenging. But we just want to assure you, you will graduate because we will be beside to you to support you and to help you, and you will finish your studies. Please, now you have to help me. What? I invented this illustration one more time to make very clear. What was the purpose of that conversation that the father wanted to have with his son? But did you notice something?
let's say that the conversation lasted for 25 minutes. When the father started talking to his son, he was very nervous. He even did not want to listen, like many people who don't want to listen to the prophecies of the book of Revelation. We don't want to know about scary things. Okay. Of those 25 minutes that the father had that conversation with his son, how much of those 25 minutes were about the future? Okay, let's be very modest. Let's say at least 20 minutes. 80% of the father's talk was about the future and everything bad things that actually provoked a concern in the mind of, of, that, of that young man, creating a negative feelings in his mind and actually making him to think, to change his decision not to go there. How much of that talk was about the encouragement and the promise that they will be with him? Just maybe three, four minutes. But you see, it's not about the content. It's about the purpose. Okay, I want to ask another question. Maybe some of you will think, then why didn't father just spend those two, three minutes and put son in front of himself and say, son, we just want to tell you. When you go to that university, your mother and your father will be with you to support you and to finish. How seriously would the son take that promise? You know, you have kids. That's okay, Dad, that's, that's okay. Let's go to the airport. He would not even hear that, that promise. But you see, after about 20 minutes and maybe even longer, the father was explaining all that dark, bizarre, and terrifying future that was very realistic, very realistic. And when finally the father made that promise to the son, that promise was sealed in the mind of that, of that boy. So let me ask you a question. When son, that, that boy is at that university there. And they, they, he became so stressed and he cannot move any longer. What is the first thing that will come to his mind? When he is in the financial situation, what will come? To, you know what? Nobody has to teach him. He will move there to the phone, pick up the phone there to call his parents. I just told you this is just an illustration. But I know that illustration changed my life. It changed the life of many, many of my students and also camp meeting audience, also many, many pastors. It helped them. How much of the book of Revelation is about the future? But you see, it's not about the content. It's about the purpose of this book. You see, the book of Revelation could be just 15 verses. God could tell us everything. He is coming on the clouds. But before that, he will be with us. He will support us. He will guide us and lead us. We can always rely on him. But you see, Jesus Christ, he knew that the full impact of his promise to be with us and the full meaning of that promise that he will be with us to help us to take the future seriously. Are you still with me? To take that future seriously, that we can prepare ourselves for that future would not be effective if he does not tell us about what the future will bring to us. Actually, if you open your Bibles, we read in the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse 4, Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you, so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. What is the purpose of the biblical prophecies? Of course, the purpose is to move us down to our knees to take the future seriously, but about all, not to make us the concern, afraid and terrified of that future, is simply to telling us that we are not left alone on this earth. That Jesus Christ, who is presented in the four gospels, 
has given us that promise that he will with us always until the very end of the age. And the purpose of the book of Revelation is telling us how he's fulfilling that promise. So when we know that he is with us, we will take our Christianity seriously. We will take our spiritual life seriously. It will make us to be better Christians to treat other people the way how Jesus treats, treats, treats people. And also to make us more serious about the future we'll bring so that we know Jesus said, when those things are start taking place, you can lift up your heads and know that your salvation is coming on. Friends, the correct understanding of the book of Revelation will help us not to think too much about this life. Yeah, we live here. We have to use our life to spread the gospel message, to make life people around us better, to have that Christ-like character to present to the people that are, that are around us. But this life is not all what we have. We have that future. But that future makes sense only if we understand that that future is intended to be the revelation of God's love for us and his strong desire to support us in our lives. Once we understand the message of that book, change our perspective of this world, changes the perspective of ourselves, changes the perspective of the future. So please allow me the time that is now left to challenge you with something. Yeah, the purpose of the last book of the New Testament is to show to God's people the things that will take place in the future. And praise God for that. As a student of the book of Revelation, I'm so grateful to God for revealing this to us. We know what the future will bring. There is nothing better in this world. The history of this world is going down, down, and one day will come to its end. So keep in mind that the book of Revelation is telling us clearly What will happen in the future? Are you still with me? So we are not left alone, not as a kind of horoscope or fortune-telling book or a crystal ball. No, that's not that. But it's telling us where the history is moving to. So we know what will happen. And according to the book of Revelation, I want just to tell the viewers, what we learn from the book of Revelation is that the time is coming as, as the situation in this world is get, getting worse and worse and worse and worse. That the secular and political leaders of this world will invite a religion and try to solve the problems in this world. Unfortunately, they will not be able to do it. Finally, if they try to find a scapegoat for that. And according to the Bible, the, there will be union of religion and politics. And there will be distinction between those who will be faithful to God until the very point of death. And the Bible is telling us at that drastic moment, a decisive moment in human history, then Jesus Christ will come. This is just in a nutshell what we learn from the book of Revelation. But what is the problem with regard to those things that will take place in the future? The two things that we do not know. Okay, what is that? The first thing, we don't know when those things will take place. We don't know when. And friends, this is exactly what we would like to know. Unfortunately, many people take the book of Revelation. They try to set the dates for the second coming of Christ. And so many times what they know that the text is clearly about, they try to take different directions only for own purpose. To establish if not the exact date, but the approximate date when Jesus will come. Unfortunately, I, I have to remind you of what the Bible makes very clear in Deuteronomy 29, 29. That there are secrets that they belong only to God. But to us belong only things that God has revealed to us. 
And please, we do not have a time. Maybe some other occasion here when we do a 3 ABM. I can show you how New Testament is replete with the statements that human beings will never know when the end of time will come. Jesus reminds us in Matthew 24, 36, that about the day and hour, actually, nobody, nobody knows. In the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 7, the disciples came to Jesus and asked him, are you going now to establish your kingdom? Jesus told them, it's not given to you to know about the time and seasons which the Father has kept only for himself by his own authority. But then Jesus said, this is not given to you. But Jesus says, but what is given to you is to be my witnesses. Friends, I find people everywhere. They spend their own entire life to make prophetic charts, calculate different dates. They're spending the entire, their entire lives in doing that. But Jesus says that the time that we are using to make those prophetic charts, to calculate dates of the second coming of Christ, can be used more effectively to be Christ's witnesses. It's, I would like to, to suggest to you viewers, instead of spending time reading those charts or making them, try to make a map of the street, or the city in which you live, to go and to proclaim the gospel message and to reach those who need to be reached for Christ. Amen. Actually, in the book, Selected Messages, chapter 2, uh, page 113, we read, Again and again have I been warned in regard to time setting. There will never again be a message for the people of God that will be based on time. We are not to know the definite time either for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or for the coming of Christ. Having said that, I'd like you to keep in mind, based on the book of Revelation, we will know that the time is very close. Amen. How close? Sometimes it can be close a few months or a few years, but we will know that it is close. How close? Only God knows. But we will be moved to readiness for that, for that moment. But keep in mind, we know what will happen. We don't know when. But there is another thing that we do not know about those future events that are prophesied in the book of Revelation. Any guess what is that? We don't know how exactly those things will take place. Maybe you are confused. I just want to encourage you. Take, for instance, the mark of the beast, well-known concept in the book of Revelation. Go to internet, to Google, and type it. You will find that there are about 12 to 15 million of websites just reading the topic. This shows how much people are confused, and it means people are struggling to know because we do not know what exa how exactly the mark of the beast will be realized in this world. And I can present here many different, different topics, but please, I'd like to remind you of the statement that is found in Selected Messages, chapter 2, page 35. We are not now able to describe with accuracy the scenes to be enacted in our world in the future, but this we do know that this is a time when we must watch unto prayer for the great day of the Lord is at hand. So I'd like to invite us, as we are studying through the book of Revelation, it's so easy to speculate. Yeah, we have our curiosity. We would like really to learn what the future will bring, how the things will happen, and when. Unfortunately, God in his wisdom has not revealed it to us. The book of Revelation is not given to us to satisfy our curiosity about the future. <laughs> it's given for us, uh, to, to, it's given to us to move us to readiness. You see, the graphic portrayal of those events that are found in the book of Revelation, they're not always nice to read about. They have their goal to impress upon us the seriousness of the final crisis and our dependency on God. 
during that, that, that time. The time of crisis, when it comes, will be a reminder to God's people of Christ's promise to be with them so that he can sustain them during these difficult, difficult times. Now, I hope that I shared with you how this last book of the Bible, that is very often misunderstood, and I must say misused by different Christian groups, how actually this book is truly the revelation of Jesus Christ. Everything what is there is intended really to point to the seriousness of the future and to tell us that when the future takes place, when we get to there, God will never, never forget his people. Amen. Such understanding actually changes a human life. You see, when understood properly, the prophecies of Revelation simply have that practical purposes to teach us how to live today and to move us to be better Christians tomorrow. This sentence is very, very important. There are some people who study the book of Revelation. They say, I don't want to think about the future. It's just about today. There are some Christians that don't think about today. They just think about tomorrow, but they don't know how to live today. See, the purpose of the book of Revelation is to teach us how to live as Christians today, but to be ready for tomorrow. So I would like to invite all of you, I would like to invite our viewers to take the word of God as seriously. We will follow this textbook, and I would like to ask you that you make a copy for yourself to go through that material because every time I will tell you about material that we will cover from that revelation of the coming king. May God bless you.